friends, it's Teresa and welcome back to my channel. And today we're going to be talking about a... I don't know how to word it properly. But basically, if I only had 20 books on my shelves, what books would they be? And are these books something I'd be content I'd be happy to reread? Naturally, the answer is yes. I wouldn't be choosing 20 books if I didn't think I was going to enjoy rereading them. I got this idea off of Haley and Bookland's 30 if I only had 30 books. So I will leave her original video link down below for y'all. But I sat there and was like, one, 30... 30 books is 10 too many decisions for me. 20 was hard enough. And secondly, I wanted to kind of figure out and really dig deep in, within myself to see one, what books kind of mean the world to me or mean more to me than more of these books, which was very difficult. Slash, if I only had 20 books, if my bookshelf was probably th just these two shelves alone, what books would decorate these shelves. So let's just kind of get into it because 20 books may not seem like a lot but we all know my penchant for so in no particular order let's start off with the first book and that first book is going to be Ivy Aberdeen's Letter to the World by Ashley Herring Blake. Now I need to read more of Ashley Herring Blake's books. I've made a complete and total mess of myself in front of her via Twitter, so at this point, it's just an obligation. She's a middle grade contemporary novel following young Ivy Aberdeen, who loses her home in a, in a tornado. As her family's kind of picking up the pieces and trying to figure out what to do with their lives after this, she realizes that her book, the draw, the book that she uses to draw, that she, draw, she doodles in kind of her diary, is missing. And with it, there are the pictures of her holding hands with girls. She's trying to not think too much about it, that is until one day these pictures start showing up inside her locker and she has to figure out who this person is but also Loki wishing deep down that this that the person who is giving sending her these um these images back or her pictures back is the girl she Loki has a crush on. I love this. I talk about this book so often, at least like once a year since I read the book, and it just means the world to me because I would have given anything, anything to have had a book centering around figuring out your sexuality and figuring out yourself as a middle grade novel. I feel like we always discuss coming out books as more of an older genre for like YA when you've kind of, I guess, like figured yourself out. But I feel like it's also important for us to start discussing themes of little kids figuring themselves out before, in a sense before you people would argue that they don't know themselves just quite yet because I feel like kids are more in tune with themselves. The next one should come as no surprise to you. Sadly, it is a little bit damaged. We got a we got a cat who got a chance to play with it. But that is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. This is not the edition that I had annotated a couple years like la a couple years ago with that lovely failed video. Appreciate that because my all my content went away. But this is one of the what is this one? Which edition is one? This is a Penguin Classics edition. My friend actually recommended this to me or like the cover because she knows how much I love the cover. This is a classic, a goth Yes, a gothic classic following young Dorian Gray as he gets his pa his picture, his portrait painted. He ends up getting quite distraught at, at the realization that this portrait of his will stay young forever while he becomes old and ages and, you know, dies. And he somehow makes a deal with the devil to sell his soul so that way that he will remain forever young while his portrait will start to see the signs of aging with every sin that he commits, slash, with every year that passes. It's one of my favorite classics, probably the favorite classic, and I think the only classic I have listed on this list as of right now. I love rereading this book. I reread. It. I try to reread it once a year. I don't think I did it last year, but I will definitely be doing it this year for Trick or Treatathon because now I have the uncensored version back there, behind Cersei. So be prepared for a lot of Dorian Gray content in October. The next book is another favorite of mine that often makes an appearance on this channel, and that is More Happy Than Not by Adam Silvera. I have mentioned this book at least twice in the past couple of months, so I will try to basically wrap up what this book is about, but specifically about young Aaron, who is kind of reeling after his father's suicide, trigger warning, suicide in the book, and he's trying to find happiness within his current family life. That involves his girlfriend, Genevieve. That is until he meets Thomas, who is a new neighbor who he thinks might be a little... That's all I can really say about the book, just because I would be talking too much about it and I've mentioned it three times. This will be my third time mentioning it already in the in the three months and I'm 
I love this book to tears, but I can only say so many times what a book is about before I get tired of hearing myself give a, give a synopsis over and over again. It's one of my favorite books. It honestly, I wouldn't say, it, it caught me at a time where I did, I was struggling to find happiness in my own self. I was in a very weird place when I read the book. So I definitely do think that it got to me in the sense that I got a chance to really accept what it meant to be happy and that you can't you can find happiness in a lot of other things no matter what i highly recommend this book i believe this is adam silvera's first book so even better you get to see all the pain and suffering before he became super popular and we got to see more pain and suffering you know now i'm only on the fourth book but i'm realizing how like w a wide array of books that i have chosen and i'm kind of proud of myself for it i'm not gonna lie but the next book is actually a thriller, and that is You by, by Carolyn Kepnes. This is an adult thriller novel, as I said, following young Joe, who has slowly becoming obsessed with a young girl named Beck. And this book chronicalizes... Chronicles? This book follows him as he falls deeper in and deeper into his obsession. This is all told in second person. We are seeing it through the eyes of Joe mainly, but he does say things in second person a lot. Like he'll talk about Beck and just refer to her as you. So one of my favorite TV shows of all time. I love the first season of You. It was just so jarring. And like it like I mentioned this in when I did my currently reading on it, but it gave me Lolita vibes in the sense that it made you feel comfortable in what Joe was doing. It rationalized so well to a point that you just kind of were sat there, not really thinking how wrong everything was until he would say something and then you were pulled back into reality. Joe gets away, away with a lot of th the things that he does in this book, I think partially because he is a white man and we do have a tendency to forgive white people, specifically white men in a society. And I just, okay, no. Oh. The next book is actually a poetry collection and that is The World's Wife by Carol Ann Duffy. This is a collection of poems basically re not rewriting but showing us historical events through the lens of the women in the historical events. It also has fictional the fictional beings, um, mythological beings like we have Red Riding Hood and then we also have we have a we have quite a bit in here. It's one of my favorite poetry collections. I need to give it a reread. I probably will end up marking up this book just because I can't see myself putting in, like tabs in it. But I love this one. I my friend Ethel recommended this to me because I told her I was trying to get more into poetry and I was like struggling. So this was her recommendation and I highly recommend it if you're looking for a kind of a feminist poetry collection that kind of twists a lot of like your the things that you're comfortable with, like mythological beings, historical figures on its head a little bit more and gives it a little bit more of a feminist little boop. The next one is actually another one of my favorites. I do mention this book on my channel quite a bit, but I don't think I've mentioned it recently. I could be wrong. And that is Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky. This is an adult contemporary novel following young Charlie as he's trying to work through his own demons during his freshman year. This is all told in letter format. He's writing to his friend his unnamed friend, as he's going through these things, such as mental health and everything. I realize that some of these books have trigger warnings and I didn't mention it, so I will leave the trigger warnings for the previous books down below for y'all, but this is, a, this is a very heavy book. It deals with a lot of heavier topics, such as like sexual assault, abuse, um, some homophobia, depression, uh, suicide. So if you are not ready to pick up this book, I suggest you don't, but it is such a good book. It's one of my favorite books and I feel like it discusses a lot of like mental uh, mental health aspects that aren't glorified or romanticized in my opinion. While it also goes ahead and gives us an it gives us a different perspective of mental health following more so a, ma a male's perspective because I feel like we don't discuss a men's perspective on mental health enough on, on in the world. So I feel like this is also a really good thing to talk about and read. It's one of my favorite books and one of my favorite movies. The next book might be a surprise to some of you guys, and that's okay. But that book is The Immortal Instruments by Cassandra Clare. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. Y'all are probably sitting here going, Therese, there are so many other Cassandra Clare books on your shelf that you can choose to reread or have on solely on your shelf. Why this one? Now, before we get into it, this is a YA urban fantasy novel following young Clary Frey who finds out that she's not exactly human once her mother is taken by some demons. She finds that she's a shadow hunter who are kind of these people hidden with her in her own who are destined to fight the demons and keep us safe at bay. So it's her trying to figure out one where her mother went and secondly this entire ordeal. Now I ended up choosing this one and not the other myriad of shadow hunter books on this shelf 
for one good particular reason. One, Twilight is what got me back into writing. I'll say that right now. I owe a lot of like my love for writing for some reason to Twilight. Secondly, this series got me back into reading. Um, I don't know why. I, don't, I was so against these books when I was younger that I didn't want to read them. And then I read them in high school on a whim. And I was like, hmm. Huh. Okay. I think I read the books right before the movie came out because I was interested in the movie and I was like, you know what, I'm going to be a prince and I'm going to read the book before I watch the movie. But I love this book. It, it has a lot of its problems, but I love it based solely for the fact that it was a Kickstarter to all of this. And to boot, it was the Kickstarter, the Kickstarter to get me back into reading. And also, for some reason, anytime I'm in a weird slump when it comes to writing, my first thought is to always read the first chapter of this book. I don't know what kind of magic is imbued in this book or in this chapter, but it just does the trick. And I always feel so inspired and so ready to write. So I think, naturally, I would have to keep this book in my collection if I only had 20 books that I was allowed to keep. The next one will also surprise you guys, primarily because it's not the beginning of the series, but the end of a duology, and that is Crooked Kingdom by Leigh Bardugo. This is the, sec the sequel to Six of Crows, as you all know. And this is a YA high fantasy story that's kind of a spin- that is a spin-off slash a branch off of the original Grishaverse trilogy, and it follows a high story with criminals. It's good. It's really good. Something about Leigh Bardugo's writing and the way that she crafted her characters in this second series is just absolutely marvelous. It's magical, and I love that she was inclusive in this by including a South Asian girl, so, uh, someone with a disability, a physical disability, a dark-skinned bisexual boy, um, a, a plus size, a mid-size, a plus size girl, and then um, what is it? Someone with a reading disability as well. There are other things in here, but she was very inclusive with the series and I'm so happy for it just because I know how much this series means to everyone and I love, I love how the duology ended. Would I like a third one? Yes, but are we unworthy? Yes. I like how this ended. I like that we kind of kept a lot of the things that were true to the characters, true to them to the very end. Even at the end when we knew there were romances that were involved, some characters didn't require that physical, like, moi moment, if you guys know what I'm talking about, to really solidify their appreciation and love for each other. Well, some of them did, and I think it's a very important thing for authors to include different forms of diversity and be inclusive in their writing, and I think Lee Bardugo did a wonderful job with this particular duology. You all know I can't go without mentioning my Filipinos. I kind of decided, this one might be a surprise because I have read plenty of other Filipino novels just in the past couple months alone and I have raved about them and while I would love to, like one of them I would love to add, would have loved to have used is The Bone Witch. However, I haven't finished that series yet and so I don't know exactly which part of The Bone Witch like, series I would like to include on this list. But, so I decided to keep it a little, let's fast things up a little bit. That book is Patron Saints of Nothing by Randy Rabai. This is a YA contemporary novel following young Jay who finds out his cousin Jun was shot dead for being involved in drugs in the Philippines. Confused about exactly what happened and why this happened, he takes his spring break and travels to the Philippines to find out. There he gets to learn not only about his, cult, his culture that he's kind of lost over the years of living in America, but then also learns that things aren't always what they seem and he, that what we see in the media isn't always what's accurate. I believe I gave this book like a three or a four stars, but I love this book. I think it's one of the instances where we see Filipino culture both the good and the bad and neither side is glorified, brought down or like super glorified or whatever. It was purely from an outsider's perspective and we get to see Jay kind of come to terms with these aspects about his family and his life and really just find a, want to find a way to make it a better place for his family. It, I, I, it didn't feel like it came off as very like, I guess, white savior even though Jay is not white. But it does kind of come off, give off this idea that like he is in a place of privilege so to help people, people with his face, people who is his family. So why shouldn't he use it? 
So I like that. And even though I did have my issues with it, it is still one of like my probably my very up there books. And I do enjoy this book very much. But the next book is actually one that I read recently or recently-ish. And that is Blanca y Roja by Anna Marie Mecklemore. This is Anna Marie Mecklemore's, I want to say, third release their third release and I loved it so much. This is a YA kind of magical realism book following these two sisters who have been pit against each other their entire lives and that is because when they come of age mag majestic swans will come and take the other sister and turn her into a swan. That is until they might have found their answer with this young boy who went missing all these years ago and has magically appeared from the forest. I love this book so much. I loved Anna Marie Mecklemore's first book, which is When the Moon Was Ours, loved it to tears, and I love this especially. This has so many themes of like just sisterly love and what that love can do to someone and what it means to break a generational curse in all aspects and walks of life. It's a, a mix of a retelling between the Swan Lake and what was it again? I'm pretty sure it's just the Swan Lake, but I could be very wrong. But I love this so much and I want to keep it on my shelves. I would love to reread this book over and over and over again. It's just glorious. I love it so much and Anna Marie Mecklemore is a very diverse, is a wonderfully diverse author in the sense that they are part of the LGBTQ community. They are, I believe, non-binary or genderqueer. They are part of the Latinx community and also they write characters who are part of that community as well. So, love it. The next book is a book that I read, I think, in 2019. And that is Speak by Laurie Hals Anderson. This is a YA contemporary novel following young Melinda af uh, uh, shortly after she has been sexually assaulted. I will leave all the trigger warnings for these books down below. I sometimes will forget them, but I don't want you all to forget them when you go ahead and pick it up. I will leave them down below and then I will also leave my reviews of these books if they are available down below for y'all as well and they will have the trigger warnings. But this follows her at directly after being sexually assaulted at a, freshman a freshman high school party. In her attempt to tell people, she tells the police which probably gets the party shuts down and turns her into an outcast. Because no one listened to her, she stopped talking completely. That is, until she finds herself kind of head over heels for her art class and finds this is the only place where she can really express herself and express her feelings and express what happens to her in a safe environment where she will feel listened to. I love this book. I didn't know what I was gonna get out of this book. I had watched the movie when I was really young, like way too young to understand it, but this book is phenomenal. And it discusses a lot of things about what sexual assault does to someone and what it, not only what it does to someone, but how it can change everything about them. How they interact with the world, how they interact with the people around them, and how victim blaming is the worst thing, one of the worst things you could do to someone who just wants to get their story out. I found this book to be really near and dear to my heart following my own personal experiences with sexual assault. Not so much the what this like the events leading up to the assault, but how she handled it and what she did and how she processed it. This was a lot and I highly recommend it and I would not give up this book for anything like this is a this book will have a permanent spot on these shelves even I have to keep buying a new cover over and over again the next one's actually a tough thing for me to decide on because I was I wanted to keep all these books to having one author on the shelf and this one I was very torn on because I love this author and I loved all the books that she's written so I was like what book do I pick so I just bit the bullet and I went with the seven husbands of Eve Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid Daisy Jones in the back over there glaring at me, so we're just gonna... But this is an adult historical fiction novel following Evelyn Hugo, who is kind of a starlet. The starlet, a starlet of old Hollywood back in the 60s. And she, no one really knows, kind of, why she has seven husbands. That is until one day she calls on Monique Grant, a kind of down herself reporter, to give the expose, to give the scoop, to spill all the tea on her seven husbands. I love this book. It is one of the first books I want to say that I've read that has mentioned bisexuality on the page in a concrete way. Like I want to get it tattooed on my body somewhere. Maybe not, but that's how strongly the quote made me feel. I also love the framework of this and how Evelyn frames her narrative and what she had to do to get on top and what she had to sacrifice. This book was also one of the first few books that made me cry like a baby. It was just so good and I love that we had a, um, 
a POC, Evelyn is Cuban, she is bisexual, none of those are spoilers. So I just, it's such a good read and I will die with this. I, I will, I love this book, I truly, I do. And it was so difficult choosing between this and Daisy Jones because Daisy Jones also has a close place in my heart, but not as close as I think Eve Evelyn does. And how Evelyn had to traverse the world as a woman of color and as a queer woman of color in time where those things weren't necessarily the most accepted things in the world. Not to say that they are now, but more accepted now than it was back then. The next book is also another favorite of mine, and that is The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. This is a YA contemporary novel following young Xiomara, who is kind of struggling to make sense of the world. She's starting to like boys, she's starting to not follow what her mother wants, people are starting to look at her for her body. She just wants to find a place in this world. That is until one day she finds poetry, specifically slam poetry and finds herself a niche in where she can feel comfortable to discuss these things is written in verse. This was just so poetic and something about the way that Elizabeth Acevedo wrote this story just had me imagining everything. Even though it was written so precisely and so succinctly, I could picture everything and I could understand Xiomara's plight and her kind of struggle with religion and her body changing and her view on boys and why her views are different from her mother's and different from her father's and it's just so good and I highly recommend it if you haven't read it I know that you guys are probably like oh I'm not a biggest fan of poetry audiobook Elizabeth Acevedo I feel like with slam poetry audiobooks always the best way to go if you're not if you're not totally sure because it is a if that slam poetry is a very audible poem to read that makes sense to digest and Elizabeth Acevedo is the one who narrates this so I highly highly recommend the audiobook for this specific one the next one should come to no surprise because I'm a paranormal romance slut and that is Fallen by Lauren Kate TB you can let it out now I'm sure he's been waiting to be like um where's my paranormal romance but this is a YA paranormal romance following young Luz who attends a boarding school after an incident where she is uh, after a fire where she ends up comes out alive but the classmate she was with does not at this boarding school for troubled teens and troubled youth she meets Daniel who is so mysterious and so attractive to her she doesn't quite understand why she also meets the very mysterious and bad boy Cam who whom she's also very attracted to though she thinks that those are less about the personality and more about the body parts. One of my favorite romances, paranormal romances, it's one of the few things I got when I was younger, I got into a huge paranormal romance binge after Twilight. So it was this, then we got some like bale fire, then we got the night world, and there's just a good, it was a good time. But it was one of my favorites. I love the take on reincarnation and angels and this concept. I loved it and I feel like I didn't see that a lot with the paranormal romances that I was reading back then. I still don't see it a lot actually. So I highly recommend this. It's good. I haven't seen the movie yet. TB, we still need to watch that movie. Figure it out. But highly recommend this book. I need to do another reread and actually reread the entire series. But I don't know how I'm going to do that just quite yet. So stay tuned. The next one is actually the middle. The smack center of a series. And that is Catching Fire by Suzanne Collins. This is the second book to Hunger Games, and that is a YA dystopian novel following young Katniss Everdeen, who volunteers to join the Hunger Games, which is a game, a, a game as we all know, where they send in children to die. The second book is Superior. The framework and the writing was just a lot more dynamic. We weren't just stuck in Katniss's head for a good chunk of the book. We saw her interact with people and show more of herself and more of the parts of her that she t she hid in the first book. We saw more of her motivations that were just above, that were more than just prim. We saw her become this figure for a revolution. And, and we saw Finnick O'Dear. Y'all can see where my priorities are. But this is my favorite book out of the trilogy. It's top tier. It's amazing and it's one of my favorite things. I love to rewatch the second movie for that specific reason. The next book on this list is a bit of a surprise because I had a different book picked out for this specific author, but I literally just finished this book last night and I was like. And that is Kingdom of Ash by Sarah J. Mass. Before y'all come for me, 
I finished this book yesterday. I can't get too much into it because it is the last book in the series and I literally, it, there is no wrap up yet. So, but this is a YA high fantasy novel following young Selena Sardothian who has been enslaved in, in the camps of Endovir for a good chunk of her life. That is until one day the wonderful Prince Dorian comes right up and says, I will free you as long as you serve at the, ch at the champion's battle and then serve as the king's champion should you win. Then after like say five years, you're good to go. You're good to go. And this is the thrilling conclusion to that freaking long series. I'm putting this here as a book that I, I want to keep. It, I was actually torn between Tower of Dawn and Empire of Storms for this one because those three, those last two books also top tier. But I think this is a wonderful conclusion. There is something about Sarah J. Mass's writing where I found myself in literal hyster like literally hysterically sobbing. I was texting Andrea as I was blasting through like the last like half of this book and like I was sobbing. And, like when I read this on a quick day trip to Sacramento with my boyfriend and I was wearing shorts and I read this bit and he like literally was like, oh my god, I just felt all the goosebumps on your leg just activate. I don't know what it is about Sarah J. Mass's writing, but her writing from A Court of Thorns to the end to the end of this. I don't know which one came out first, if it was T O G or A Court of Thorns, but just her writing in this series alone has transformed to an adult to one from young adult to adult high fantasy. And to boot, something about her writing just inspires me to write more and more. Like I was in a weird writing slump and then I read this book and now all I want to do is write. So I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna, I would like to keep this last book in here even though it hurt me deeply and I am kind of in denial about some of the things that happened. <sighs> hey friends, it is future Therese. Well, technically past Therese when you guys are watching this. It's not editing, Therese. I'm gonna just say post-filming this video, Therese, because that can encompass a lot of things. But I was putting my books away, you know, after a nice hot shower, makeup's off, everything, when I realized that I missed a book. So instead of 20 books, it's 19 books. So, I, and I feel very bad for this, because this is actually one of my favorite books of the all this time, as you all are aware. But the 20th book is The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. This is a retelling of the Achilles myth, as you guys are all well aware, as I have spoken about this book at least once a year on this channel. But I love this book for multiple reasons. This is like the first book that got me, one, back into my Greek mythology craze. Not that I think I ever really left it. And it's also one of the first books that made me cry. Aside from The Best of Me by Nicholas Sparks, that was like more of a light Walmart mist than it was like droplets of tears. It's just written so beautifully and it gives me so much compassion for Achilles as a character where I feel like we kind of lost that. Well, it's non-existent, we didn't lose it. In the original Trojan War myth, in, in, in the original Homer myths, or... I'm forgetting what it's called. It's like 5 p.m. I just got back from work. I just want to take a shower. So you guys know where this is at. But yeah, I can never not see myself with a copy of this book on my shelves. It's one of my favorite books of all time. I'm still looking to see if another Greek myth retelling can make me feel the same way the Song of Achilles has made me felt. Because, oof, was this a lot. The second last book is actually a guilty pleasure read of mine. If y'all know what that is, because I mention it quite a bit on this channel, that is The Selection by Kira Cass. This is a YA kind of dystopian romance novel. Think of it as The Hunger Games meets, meets The Bachelor. In this new world, America Singer puts her name in to be part of the, the King's like kind of bachelor program, where she puts her name in, is chosen, and she goes through this entire kind of vetting process to see which one the prince falls in love with and then she will become the queen. I don't read this book for the world building or the plot. I just love the angst and the drama. That is all. It I, th This book, this series actually has a, has a place near and dear to me and that is because I ended up reading the entire trilogy while I was away in Ireland. I think I brought this book with me to Ireland and then I came home with this book and the, sec the next two books in the series. I love this series. It's just full of drama and angst and then just trash for non-stop drama and angst and all the bad tropes. So much miscommunication. 
but you know, we can't always read top tier literature. We gotta let ourselves read the trashy reads every now and again, and that's okay. But the next book is Grown by Tiffany D. Jackson. This is a YA contemporary novel following young Enchanted who wants to become a singer. And after f entering a contest, she catches the eye of Corey Fields, a well-known R&B artist, and he ch he plans on mentoring her. However, his intentions aren't necessarily the purest ones. I made a full review on this, so I'll leave that link down below. But I, this book was so hard-hitting and just so shocking. But the way that Tiffany D. Jackson wrote it and framed it had me at the edge of my seat and wanting to read it and learn more about what happened to Enchanted and whether or not she got the justice that she deserved. It was such a good book. I cannot wait to continue reading on with more of Tiffany Jack D. Jackson's work. I believe my next one of her works will either be her 2021 release, which sounds like a horror movie, or Monday is not coming. Either way, I love this book. It's so hard-hitting and definitely it touches on the parts that discuss that police just don't believe women, specifically black women. Police's treatment of black women is like terrible and also kind of the entire concept of how forgiving we are of like celebrity figures when it comes to the atrocities that they commit. Such a hard-hitting book and I just, it's, it's a lot. And the last book on this list is actually another, not a guilty pleasure, but it's another paranormal romance because I am trash. And that is the first three books of the Night, the Night World series slash like the first bind up. This has the first three books, which is The Secret Vampire, Daughters of Darkness, and Spellbinder. This is a YA paranormal romance following vampires and witches hidden within a world of our own and what, the hap what happens when that world collides with mortals. I love this. I love this. Along This book, along with Immortal Instruments, is what gets me back into writing. Gets me writing and going. And the first bind up is absolute gold. Will we ever get the last book? Probably not, but it's fine. Yeah. Love this book. Highly recommend the Night World series if you have not read it yet. So good. And she also wrote The Secret Circle and The Vampire Diaries. But that is it for the 20 books that I would love to have in my shelves if I could only limit myself to 20 books. What books would you guys have in your shelves? Maybe not give me the entire 20, maybe top 5, because you know 20 is a lot of decisions to make. But until next time, hit like, subscribe, comment. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys in my next one. Bye!